the sin list is working as a, to become a fast track for the most urgent substance of very high concern uh, for authorization. But it also, we want to influence uh, the official REACH candidate list by working uh, with member states and try to influence them and give an inspiration for them for proposing new substances for the REACH candidate list. But one important thing that uh, has, was uh, not the key message in the beginning, but has evolved during, uh, during the last three years, is to provide assistance to companies in their substitution work. It's to provide alert on coming regulation, which has been proving quite successful. We have ident been identifying ahead of the candidate list which substances would appear there. But it also, as an avoidance list, to communicate with the suppliers what substances should you avoid in your, in your products. Because the product cycles for most companies, they're quite long. There's more than a year. And the candidate list being updated twice a year, you could potentially be in big, have big problems having substances of very high concern in your products if, you don't really, if you're not really careful how to go about this when already uh, ordering your, substance, uh, your articles but also facilitate informed choices, both for companies, to how to go about with the substitution work within the companies. You must have information, and the sinless can provide that information to a certain extent. But also, NGOs, uh, we want to provide support for NGOs, and uh, that's been uh, quite successful also. Several NGOs have been uh, building their campaigns on the information they have found on the sin list. So this has been uh, the background and the aim of the sin list so far. So, what's new? We have sin list yesterday, the latest version was sin list 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, sin list 1.1 had CMR substances, we had PBT substances, we had also equivalent level of concern substances with a few endocrine disruptors already in the first sin list. And now we have added specifically endocrine disruptors. And the difference this time is that we are focusing solely on the endocrine disrupting properties of these substances. For the first sin list, when we also assessed equivalent level of concern substances, EDCs, they were one part of the puzzle. Because we took EDC properties, we took biomarketing information, we took PBT properties, all those things uh, making one assessment if, if the substance would fulfill the equivalent level of concern criteria. So that is the difference and why there are already a few EDCs on the sin list uh, before and why we have added even more today. And the reason we heard this morning from Pete, why is it so important to add EDCs? We heard that quite clear, EDCs need to be taken care of, also from uh, Ninja mentioning this. So. How did we go? What would we do? Uh, we had a three-step procedure. We had a screening phase, we had a literature research, and then the evaluation part and assessment, making an informed judgment of these substances, each individual substances. First, starting, uh, starting point for the screening, we used the uh, European Commission, the EDC database, they have been building on the last 10 years. Uh, this database, has information on category one, that is substances where you have in vivo information that there's an endocrine disruptor. We have category two EDCs, meaning that we have in vitro evidence of uh, EDC properties, and then category three A and three B, meaning there's no evidence or there is not enough information uh, available. This was our starting point. And from this, uh, this uh, European Commission database, uh, consisting of 553 substances. They started with a, a few more, but they were disregarded uh, from uh, expert judgment. We took 553 from that list, and we selected the ones that already had information on EDC properties, that is, category one and category two substances. That gave us 319 substances to work with. And then, of course, it's not really a point assessing chemicals that you're already listed, so then, of course, we remove all the substances we're already on the sin list. It's quite a natural step. And also, as Ninja mentioned, we want to remove the substances that are not relevant from the REACH perspective. 
but it, and also that's not possible to identify. For example, if a substance doesn't have a unique CAS or uh, EC number, it's not really possible to get the uh, information we want from them. So such substances were removed. And also, for example, dioxins and furans that not intentionally produced, it's not really a point in uh, taking care and analyzing those substances also. And also, as uh, Ninja mentioned, <laughs> uh, we used uh, 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 no, uh, uses as a proxy for, um, for exposure and reach relevance. And this gave us 44 substances that obviously is a bit hidden, uh, but uh, I promise this, um, uh, 41, I mean, sorry. And then it was time for a literature research on these 41 substances. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this will be covered by a um, video presentation uh, uh, from Dr. Kal Kwiatkowski from TEDx, the endocrine, uh, endocrine disruption exchange in the US. And then and the evaluation part. So there are some information how to evaluate substances of equivalent level of concern. There are in REACH and there are in the guidance documents in REACH. And we, of course, we want to evaluate towards the criteria of substance of very high concern. That is the point, that is the starting point for uh, any substance that we're going to add to the SIN list. And we're using the information that they say it should be done on a case by case basis due to the lack of the criteria. So that's what we've been doing. This time, we should only look at in vivo data. We need in vivo data. So uh, tests performed in intact animals. We need that data to be as sure as possible. This is actually a substance of very high concern. But we didn't disregard from in vitro data. Of course not. We used in vitro data as supportive evidence for the in vivo evidence. And also, we wanted at least uh, three studies available. And two out of those had to be in vivo for even considering an evaluation. Else, we just disregarded from them say we don't have enough information at this point. And then, considering the strength of evidence of the, each individual substance, we reach the 22 substances that you can find in your conference package. I have a few remarks to this methodology. As mentioned, our scope is only substances of very high concern. So our evaluation has been based on that information. And that means that there are a lot of more EDCs that do exist. But they, at this point, we don't have enough evidence of them, or we don't have enough evidence for saying these are EDCs as substances of very high concern. But they should not be disregarded. This is where science comes in, and we should get, try to get more information on how they're working and their potency as endocrine disruptors, as SVHCs. And this is, just, this is not a final list. Of course, if we don't have all the information available, we can't have all the substances available at the same time. So meaning, with more science, we will have more substances on the SIN list. So in conclusion, the SIN list, it's, a, it's been a forerunner since th uh, three years ago. It's been a forerunner in identifying substances of very high concern. And we have science in place, and it's time to make use of that information we already have today. Business can use it, regulators can use it, and then, of course, it's time for action. Thank you very much.